So good evening. Uh, very very tough job to start day two because the, the quality yesterday was was really so good. And and after I went to bed and the presentations can continued, I, I picked up again on Twitch uh, this morning. Um, really outstanding. So uh, I'll try my best, but forgive me if it doesn't it doesn't quite match up to, to what we enjoyed yesterday. So smart smart stacks in in VHDL. Um, the first thing I suppose why why have they allowed somebody to come and talk about VHDL at Euroforth? Um, uh, that's that, that's uh, that's a good question. Fortunately, uh, again, Klaus yesterday gave um, a very intriguing presentation about a soft processor. If you're interested in fourth, and so I think anybody who saw what Klaus is doing with microcore doesn't need to be told why it's interesting um, to do things in VHDL. You're already intrigued. Um, but here's my simple summary. So why why VHDL? If you look here on the left, you can see. A, a, a concept of software and hardware with a firm division between them, and this is this is how things work. For example, if you're working in C and you're 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 programming a CPU or a microcontroller, there is a hard boundary between the software and the hardware. But would you prefer a soft boundary? If you work in Forth, well, Forth is a low-level language which you can turn into a, a high-level language as you as you build up a lexicon to, to suit your application or suit your problem. But you can also turn Forth into a low-level language, an even lower-level language, when you start to interact dynamically with the hardware. So as, as Klaus said yesterday, you can delegate to the hardware. And so you can actually have a, a flexible interaction between your, your software system and your hardware. And you can move components between the two. And that's really the interest um, of, of uh, FPGAs and, and programming. And it, and it works very well with Forth because it is a language which just sits so nicely on the bare metal. So all fourth processors, um, all stack processors, are going to need a stack. That's probably the most fundamental thing. Um, and I want to show you an approach that Uli and I have been looking at, um, building Seedbed, which is um, the hardware component of our new synthesis um, and Seedforth explorations. Um, I'm going to show a few um, code snippets of VHDL. Here's one. They're not very complicated, I, I should say, and, and I'm only a, a hobbyist at VHDL. Um, Klaus and, and Bernd are professionals. Um, but, but you can think of VHDL as producing design entities in two parts. So one part is an entity declaration here, which is basically an interface. Generics are constants. And, and down here we have the port, which describes the signals going in and out of an entity. So into this entity, there is a clock signal, a reset, um, some other things that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and underneath this, there will be one or more architectures which describe how this entity goes about making its outputs from its inputs. Um, and a stack is, is really just memory at, at heart. And so this is how you might define a stack as memory. There is a clock signal because we're using synchronous logic. There is a reset signal um, so that the whole design can be reset um, or, or can be initiated following a power up. The input is whatever you might like to push to the top of stack at some point in time when you choose to do so. Um, and in this simple model of a stack as memory, you need to supply your own stack pointer if you're instantiating this, this entity. Um, and that stack pointer is simply the, the memory address at, at which you will write. Um, it's called stack pointer n because it's the stack pointer at the next cycle because we're going to write into memory and we're going to update the stack pointer in the following cycle. Um, and you read and write in different places, potentially, if you're going to move the stack pointer. You might not always leave it in the same place if you're going to drop something or if you're going to add something to the stack. And that's why you need to be able to move it. You also have a write enable because it is just memory. And then the output here is whatever's on the top of stack. Um, and the system, whilst you have to provide it with the stack pointer for the next clock cycle, once you've done that, it can tell you what the stack pointer was on the last clock cycle. So it gives you a satisfactory set of outputs, but the um, but the instantiating entity will need to do quite a bit of management work. Um, however, this is the sort of fundamental component of a stack. And if it's written well um, in VHDL, the chances are the synthesis tools will um, uh, implement it as, as block RAM. It won't actually use registers on the uh, FPGA fabric. It'll be instantiated as block RAM, very efficient. And as Klaus alluded to yesterday, you can probably expect a, a one clock cycle latency, so as fast as it can possibly be, essentially. But it's not that easy to manage. And so 
what we might prefer to have is a stack that understands stack operations. Um, and so my stack entity two here that I'd like to show you um, is one step more advanced. In this case, we, we don't supply um, a, the, the um, updated stack point. We don't have to do those calculations ourselves. But what we do is we supply a stack operation here. We supply a stack operation, um, which is an, an enumerated type. So VHDL can actually synthesize enumerated types. It, 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 it lays them out as um, uh, arrays of standard logic. And your stack type might look like this. You have a NOP for doing nothing because um, synchronous logic updates its registers, or updates memory at every clock cycle. So if you want to do nothing, you actually have to explicitly say so. You might have a push, a drop, um, a replace, which is where you simply write something without changing the stack pointer, um, and a reset if you want to bring the stack pointer back to, to whatever its initialization value is. So this is a bit more flexible, and you've, abstract, you've started the abstraction process. We now have a, a stack which essentially understands how to do uh, simple pushes and pulls. What can we do next? Okay, well, before we get on to that, I just wanted a, a quick note on, on how, this, how this is implemented inside um, the architecture. Um, you can see here a case statement, and, and actually I, I noted yesterday when Klaus was speaking, he mentioned how if you want to include new instructions um, in microcore, you just go and put something, you include another when statement in a case. And this is how a lot of VHDL works. This is how a lot of logic works. Essentially, you have a multiplexer, um, which is what this case uh, when and case statement is, is representing. It's a multiplexer. And depending on the signal here, depending on what stack op is, um, we will set write enable to one, or we'll set write enable to zero. We'll, set, uh, we'll increment the stack pointer, or we'll leave the stack pointer as it is. The next stack pointer is equal to the current stack pointer. And so a lot of VHDL architectures look like this, a series of case statements, um, and with exactly the same signals in each case being updated in different ways. So this is a kind of architecture, very flexible and very easy to extend. So moving on, how, what, what, what next can we do with this, this simple stack? Okay, so I've, I've drawn that stack here on, on the left. Um, it's essentially a stack implemented, as I say, in memory. You have a stack point, you have an input, and you have the top of stack. And we can start to think how, how we would use that to accomplish some of the fourth words. So um, dupe would be quite easy because we could connect the top of stack to the input. Um, and then we could simply give an operation to, to push. Um, and then whatever the top of stack currently is would be fed to the input. And when the push happens, the stack pointer would move and we would duplicate the item on the top of the stack. Um, if dupe is only marginally more complicated, we would simply need to have a uh, a, a simple gated logic here to either um, uh, do nothing with the stack pointer or increment it if, if um, it's not zero, if, if top of stack is not zero. But if you think about how would we do swap, it's going to be difficult. We're going to need to have a register out here somewhere in the instantiating entity, and it's going to take two clock cycles because we'll have to save a value, and then we'll have to update that value in the following clock cycle so that we can, we can swap what was the top of stack with, with what was the next on stack. And if you start to think about rot, clearly that's going to be very difficult to do um, unless you start um, adding multiple registers and you're willing to wait multiple clock cycles for your stack operations. Stack processes are supposed to be efficient and supposed to be efficient. And so this model on the right might be more suitable. What we've done here is we've actually augmented our stack, which is memory here in the light blue, um, with some registers on top. So registers are hardware, uh, they're, they're fabric logic inside an FPGA. Um, and memory um, has the constraint, you can only read essentially one, it's assuming it's single ported, you can have dual ported memory, but thinking in the simple case with sing single ported memory, you can only read the value at one address at a time. So whatever that address is, you can, you can read that top of stack item. But a register is open, you can read that every clock cycle if you like. And so with a little bit more sophistication, we can actually combine memory and combine registers. And then we have access to the top three stack items on every clock cycle. Um, and this is handy because now we can think in, in a single clock cycle, if we, if we route these inputs and outputs accordingly, because actually we can also directly input here and we can directly input here, 
if we route these inputs and outputs accordingly, we can accomplish a lot more stack operations. So let me show you those. Okay. So with that, we can move, we can do swap, we can do rot, we can do over, we can do nip, um, we can do replace and nip. What does replace and nip do? If you have an operation like plus, where essentially you want to replace the top two stack items, but you don't actually want to delete them and then put the new item on the stack in the following clock cycle, you would use replace and nip. You just replace the top, top stack item and nip away the, the, um, the next on stack and the third on stack moves up to second on stack. Um, Jeep and if Jeep are there as well. Um, depth is also possible because you have a stack pointer and you can also write, um, you can write the stack pointer to the stack. Um, very straightforward. Okay. Um, so this is what stack three might look like having taken advantage of that um, uh, augmentation of memory with registers. We can now see both the top of the stack and the next on stack as outputs, which can be useful. For example, if you were connecting this out to um, data memory, you've now got the address and you've got the value to write. So in one clock cycle, if you were to set the write enable signal, you could actually perform a memory write. I mean, that's, uh, that's convenient. Um, the stack op is still here. And now this stack is actually managing its own stack pointer as, as stack two was. Um, it needs to be able to report underflows and overflows here. So you have these standard logic lines here, which are reporting um, any stack errors. But what about exception handling? So once you start to, to implement your fourth um, software, um, you'll, you'll, you'll come to the point where you think, what do I do about catch and throw? Um, do I ignore them? Do I bother to implement them? If I want to implement them, how do I do it? Now, typical software implementations rely on, on hooks inside the, the virtual machine, the fourth virtual machine, for reading and writing the, the stack pointers directly. Um, and that can be done in hardware. There's no, there's no restriction. We could, we could have a, a mechanism. You could either memory map the, um, the stack pointers, or you could have some special operations uh, for writing um, values to the, to the stack pointers. That's, that's all perfectly possible. Um, but in this case, what we've been trying to do, we've, we've been trying to abstract. We've been trying to abstract the stack as something which you simply give an operation to. And, and we wanted to give up having to control the stack pointer. And so the question to ask is, can we actually delegate exception handling to the hardware? How, how would we do that? OK, so I want to draw a picture of a stack which has actually got two stacks inside it. Um, in, in this simple illustration, which I've tried to keep as simple as possible, the gray box represents what's inside, and the white and what's poking out here represents the interface which is exposed um, to the outside world. And so our stack is going to expose um, an interface which looks very much like stack three. It's going to have a uh, stack operation. You'll be able to see the top of stack and the next on stack. You'll be able to supply an input. Um, there were some error lines just hidden underneath. Um, inside, it's going to be a little bit different. Inside, well, just as stack three always has, there is always, there is always at some point um, the memory and, and the registers, which I've for clarity omitted here. So we're just looking at the memory here. So here is that very first stack entity, which is, in, which is um, implemented with memory. And you can see here that we're going to actually have to manage the stack pointer. I've got another auxiliary stack over here called stack two. Um, it's a very simple stack, um, one that we displayed earlier. Um, but it's operated with stack operations, so it's not quite the same as, as this stack one over here. But we've, we've connected things up in a, in, a, in a particularly interesting way. So this auxiliary stack the only input it ever receives is the stack pointer from the main stack. The only input it ever receives. So whenever you trigger a push, whatever you do to this stack, it's just going to write the stack pointer of this stack. And with the dotted line, what we've indicated here is that actually, should you wish it to, and it's not every time because it's a dotted line, should you wish it to, you could replace the stack pointer of your main stack you could replace the stack pointer of your main stack with the output of stack two. Um, 
And that's going to give some possibilities that I'd like to show you on the next slide. So that's going to allow us to create some operations for exception in exception handling. Um, if, um, if we look at the top three operations, which I want to focus on first, we've got save stack pointer, restore stack pointer, and drop. And there's a P missing there. Should we drop stack pointer? Okay, let's go back and have a look. So if we want to implement the operation stack, save stack pointer, all we'll do, we'll do nothing with the main stack, but on the auxiliary stack, we'll, ha we'll have a push. And as the output of the stack pointer of stack one is connected to the input of stack two, a push on stack two will simply save the stack pointer. Now, what if we want to do the next operation, which is the restore the stack pointer? Well, if you think about it, what we've actually just done here, we've actually set up an exception frame because we've, we've now saved the stack pointer at a particular instance in the program flow. We can go on and do a lot of other things, but if at some point we decide there is an exception and we want to revert to that state as we were, the depth that we were at when we saved that, um, when we saved that, when we, when we created the exception frame, when we saved that stack pointer, all we have to do is call this operation here, restore stack pointer, and the stack pointer is the stack pointer of stack one is popped off stack two, stack one is updated, and is at exactly at the same depth. And provided nothing drastic has happened, like all of the values on this stack being overwritten by you know, wild program flow, if it's just an ordinary exception where a throw has occurred with a, with a non-zero throw value, then what we'll find, if this is a return stack, if this is a subroutine stack, what we'll find is we're, we're, we're in a position to carry on execution from just after the catch. And this is all abstracted within the hardware itself there's no there's no there's no software control over this software just needs to say oh we have an exception and it'll it'll return to the right point by itself in a single clock cycle atomically so there's no possibility of anything going wrong single clock cycle and it's done atomically and finally you can also drop the stack pointer because if you enter an exception frame with catch but then you actually exit the subroutine normally, or um, there, was no, there, was, there was perhaps some zero throws, there was, there was actually no exception, then you don't want, the, um, you don't want the, uh, the exception frame anymore, and you just drop the stack pointer off here without updating um, the stack pointer in stack one. Um, and that gives you pretty simple um, exception handling. Now, to mimic the fourth words catch and throw, you need a bit extra because catch and throw do some peculiar things, particularly with the parameter stack. So with a parameter stack, for example, when you, um, when you do um, trigger an exemption, an exception with a non-zero throw, what has to happen is you, um, you actually have to save that value and put it back on the stack. So we would use something like this, restore stack pointer and push. And what's happening there is we're actually restoring the stack pointer, but at the same time, we're also gonna push we're going to save that whatever was on the top of the stack. We're going to save that value and put it back on the top on the top of the stack again. Um, and, and and likewise for you know a, a case where you actually ex exit a subroutine normally, we, we would use this to put a zero on top. Um, and and you know for some some other quirks of of actually getting in and implementing catch and flow, catch and throw. I've, Uli and I have found that these um, these these other uh, words are necessary. But they're quite easily implemented. It's just another um, when clause in the in the two case statements, which comprise the case statements for um, these two stacks. And so the, the point of the presentation here, what, what we've achieved is essentially an abstraction of stacks as entities with operations that we no longer need to worry about how they manage themselves. And we find that it's a good good abstraction, arguably, because when we start combining them we're obtain, able to obtain new functionality almost for free. Um, and that functionality is well protected inside hardware um, and, and, it's, and it's, um, it's, 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 it's safe. It, it really can't be um, interfered with by anything going on outside of this, uh, outside of this design unit. Um, I'm going to give a quick demonstration. Before I do that, I want to give um, a plug to this website. Uh, I know that I, I've mentioned quite a, you know, a number of you are professional um, VHDL engineers, so apologies to you both. But for others who may be interested in VHDL or haven't done any VHDL or, or just um, you know, curious otherwise, 
Um, I found this this website really good, vhdlwiz.com. I'm not I'm not paid by this guy Jonas who runs it to to plug his website. Um, I did the advanced course, and after having you know spent several years working in VHDL, and I found that everything I thought I'd learned was pretty much nonsense, <laughs> most especially my my testing regimes. Um, and he really put me right. So um, so if you're interested, I, I recommend this, and and I think the course is is pretty good. So just to put that in there for sharing. Um, and allow me to give you now a brief a brief demonstration. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Okay. So um, we're now in Vivado. Vivado is Xilinx's, Xilinx's proprietary tool chain. This is the free web version. It's actually very powerful. Um, and what I'm going to do is run a simulation to show how we uh, will create one of these stacks and, and more importantly, how we test them. Uh, and the key learning, and actually it's what I got from taking Jonas's course, is that really any design unit you build needs an independent test. You, you can't just build an entire structure and then just test the inputs and outputs. That never works. Everything you build has got to have an independent test. So I won't take you through all the different windows here. That would take a lot of time. But let me just show you what we're going to test. Um, we're going to test a design entity which is very similar to um, the design entities that we were um, looking at in the presentation. This one's called Saving Stack. It's just um, because it's part of a larger design and it has this particular name. Um, but it has a very similar port interface here. And if we scroll down into the architecture, the only things I want to show you is we, we instantiate a main stack entity here and we instantiate an auxiliary stack entity here. So those are those two stacks that I showed you about, that I showed you. Um, I won't go through everything. And then here's this big case statement, right? So we have a process here, um, and you can see the big case statement with all of our operations. And you can see basically these are the signals that we need to update. To the two stack pointers, write enable, um, and, and, some, and some resets. And we need to decide what to do with the auxiliary stack depending on the instruction for the main stack. So, um, so it's a pretty brief entity. Um, and how do we test it? This is a very traditional, very simple test package, not a very sophisticated te test package. We um, instantiate the entity within the test package, and then we begin a sequence of process, which essentially steps through a series of clock cycles. Um, and we, this is very simple. Um, there's, there's no database testing. We simply write. We write instructions for every test that we want to occur. We set the data. Um, we set the stack operation. We um, run for one clock cycle, um, and then we do an assertion test, which is VHDL's way of saying, does this equal that, and that equal that, and that equal that? If not, we'll, we'll get an error message, and it should go all the way down to the bottom, and it should say, test completed, OK. So it's a self-testing check bench. And you'll see why this kind of self-testing check bench is handy when we run the simulation. I'm always nervous at this point, because even when you do nothing, these things have a habit of going wrong, but we'll see. So I'm running the simulation now. It's one of about 15 different simulation sets I've got, building it up. OK, that's that's nice. It's run. So so the first thing we'll do is have a quick look at the trace. So there's a waveform here. Um, and you can see the various signals, such as the top of stack. Um, this changes as we move along, depending on the test values that we were writing. The stack pointer is also changing. Um, there are some, this is a tested error underflow. There's a tested error overflow here as well. Um, but I, I'm sure you'll agree that it's quite hard to tell whether this is the right answer or the wrong answer. If it's the wrong answer and you know it's the wrong answer, you can start to dig around in here to try and find out why. But, but you certainly wouldn't want to rely on casually inspecting this to, um, to prove you're right, which is why those self-testing, self-checking test benches are so important. Because if we come down here to the log, you'll see that actually in the middle of all this, our message has come out, test completed, OK. And if we go to the code itself, we'll see that we reach stand.m.finish. So we know that's right. If something else had happened, we would have had one of these messages. So you can run these things. And if you're an experience with TCL, which I'm not, um, you can actually you can actually check for your own test completed, OK. And you can put some, some code words in there and then pick it out. And you can run all your own test benches without even having to put your finger on the keyboard and change something. And you can regression test the whole lot. So, um, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to show you. Let me switch the screen share off and move to the very last slide of the presentation, um, which is the conclusion. So, um, yeah, we call it a smart stack because it understands 
it understands how to manage itself. It understands how to do its own stack operations. You just you just specify an operation. You don't need to manage the stack pointer anymore. And we found that two two such entities encapsulated as a single stack um, provide simple exception handling. Um, and the reason we're interested in doing this is because we're working on this um, seed forth. And seed forth, the idea is to disaggregate things, see how to make them as pure and as, as disaggregated as possible. And then and then what happens when you start to recombine them in different ways? So um, so thank you very much. That's the conclusion of the presentation. At four and a half minutes to go. Um, Right, do we have any questions, please? I can see nobody waving hands and nobody writing up yeah. in uh, Mattermost. Right, ah, Stephen. Okay, Stephen. Andrew, when, when you last talked about stacks uh, a year or fourth or two or three back, it seemed to be a much more complex thing that you were talking about then and have you gone back to simplicity yes thank, thanks Stephen for remembering that presentation in, in Mallorca and um, <laughs> that, that was on the knowledge machine and then the knowledge machine was configured differently so that had one massive oh, I should, no one's no one's seeing me seeing my face I admit this I had one massive control unit for the data path and the control unit and everything else and just by making it bigger and bigger and bigger, you could do anything, which is essentially the way it worked. Um, and yes, and so basically, the, the way I would characterize it, Stephen, there was global there was global control over all the stacks, and by linking the mechanisms together, eventually we got the same effect. But this is certainly a much nicer way of doing it. Okay, so you. So are, are you really saying that having compared and contrasted the two approaches, you're sticking, you're voting for simplicity? This this is much better. And actually, um, what I mentioned in the paper is that um, I'm hoping that out of this work, we can we can build a successor to the knowledge machine, which will have a, a better design, accomplish more, and, and, and possibly even run with a higher clock frequency, because it, it won't have as much logic stuff between all the gates. Um, and so yes, it, this moving on to moving on move, moving on to big to, to to better things. That would be most exciting. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Sim. The, the, one, one of the reasons Ollie and I are thinking about this is that we want we want to the, the the seed bed as we're calling it. We want that to, to run on different platforms. So the knowledge machine was run on it ran on that Xilinx still does that that Digilent Xilinx board. But not everybody has one of those, and there are there are many boards, many smaller boards. So if we can build things up at a much more um, clean, simple dis units that we can disaggregate, it's it's going to be much easier to to port it to new boards and and smaller and cheaper boards as well. Well, it's, it Gerald, seems to be. Oh, beg your pardon. Yeah, Gerald has some comments from Twitch, and then we're uh, running out of time. So, okay, Gerald. just a cool comment for Twitch. They think it's really cool and love seeing the force implemented in hardware and the uh, high level stack abstraction hardware. And the question I was having was uh, what happened to your uh, exception handlers in the very wide stack? Do you still consider this or is this idea completely gone? Um, so yeah, the very, the very, the very wide stack had, had some, had some advantages that you could, you could store, um, for example, local variables, if I think if I'm, maybe um, addressing the point correctly, you could store local variables um, on something that looked like the return stack. But what we've done here is we've actually put um, exception handling into each stack. And in the seedbed design we've already got, there are many stacks. You don't even see them because they're, they're doing things within the control unit, which is which are necessary for the control unit, but which you don't need to know about as a fourth programmer. That's got exception handling built in. The parameter stack got, has got exception handling built in. And so if you wanted to build a stack for holding return, for, for holding local variables, a very wide one, you just put an exception, you just put you just you just build in that design within it with built in exception handling. And then you encapsulate it. And no one needs to know how you did it, but you just know it has except it just has exception handling. And provided the control unit sends out the appropriate instruction, which is just one of the regular instructions. There's no special control line, you don't need to flag it, it doesn't need a special mechanism. It's just this instruction is fire an exception or, or ignore an exception. And um, at that point, all the stacks respond simultaneously um, and in a synchronized way. Thank you. 
Okay, Great. thank you. We've run out of time on that one. So can I uh, thank Andrew? Thank you very much. Great. But thank you, and kind comments from Twitch, much, much appreciated. Thank you, Peter.